Good day and welcome to this live uh, panel discussion with the Private Sector Commission and or the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I have in studio with me Mr. Clinton Orling. He is the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry and of course he's a director of the Private Sector Commission. I also have Mr. Kit Nascimento who is the director um, of the Private Sector Commission and of course the president of the Tourism and Hos uh, Hospitality Association of Guyana. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our discussions today will center on Guyana meeting the CFATF deadline of Friday, February 20th. But before we go into discussion, I want us to take a little look at um, a clip from Mr. Roger Hernandez, the financial advisor of CFATF, who was here um, last week, met with the private sector, met with the government, the opposition, addressed the Special Select Committee of Parliament um, with regards to Guyana's obligations um, under CFATF and the, the amendments to the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism um, bill. So I want us to just take a look at this video before we actually go into our discussions. The bill itself, right, and not any ad additional amendments. The bill, as it is preferring right now, as the amendments right now are compliant with the compliant with the recommendations that were made concerning Guyana's um, meeting the AML safety standards. Guyana has to submit a report to the CFATF on its follow-up process by February the 28th. Now, in order for the bill to be considered by the CFATF plenary, the bill has to be passed and enforced by the 28th of February and submitted with the report to the CFETF. The reason this is necessary is that the CFETF has to analyze the bill for compliance and a report made to the plenary in May, this May, as to what sort of level of compliance the bill has with the international standards. On the basis of that report, the plenary will then be able to make a decision going forward with Guyana whether Guyana should be subject to further countermeasures or whether Guyana should be sent or should be recommended to the FATF for what is known as the ICRG review. If Guyana does not pass the legislation in time, the CFATF plenary would make a recommendation to the FATF that Guyana be placed within that review process. Now, we, we, I think uh, Mr. Hernandez would have given us a clear picture of where Guyana is as it relates to compliance um, with CFATF recommendations uh, with regards to anti-money laundering and um, the deadline and, and what is to follow should we miss the deadline. I want to start with you, uh, Mr. Erling. The Private Sector Commission would have met with uh, Mr. Hernandez. Let's talk a little about the meeting that you had with him. Um, you also met with the government and the opposition. Um, just, just tell us a little about well, those What meetings. I'll do, I'll put into context the overall, um, what has led us to where we are today. And I'll let Kit take over on the meeting with Mr. Hernandez, because Kit was the, uh, the chairperson of that meeting, mm -hmm. and he, had, he headed the delegation from the Private Sector Commission. Um, in May of last year, CFATF had issued a recommendation um, to both Guyana and Belize about um, really improving and amending their money laundering legislation and the counter terrorism legislation to make it compliant with the CFATF and the FATF requirements. But in that instance, it was the CFATF. So we had two deadlines that came subsequent to that. And on both occasions, in terms of passing our legislation, Guyana failed to pass the legislation, the requisite legislation. In uh, November, I think it was, or, or December last year, Guyana was actually, um, countermeasures, countermeasures were actually applied to Guyana and Belize for failing to reach or, or to implement the appropriate recommendations that came from CFATF. In, uh, on February of this year, earlier this month, um, CFATF did not recommend Guyana to the FATF process, and Guyana was given another reprieve, and on February the 28th, which is the final deadline before the next plenary session for the CFATF. And Mr. Hernandez already outlined that just now in his, in his, um, in his piece and his take. 
one of the things I need to, to underscore is that there's a, something called a 40 plus 9 recommendations, which forms the foundation of CFAT compliant requirements. And Guyana was tasked to do that, to implement those 40 plus 9. And those, those 40 plus 9 contains two dimensions. There's a lawmaking legislative dimension, and there's also a compliance dimension or an implementation dimension. So even if we get the bill passed and we meet the CFAT uh, compliance requirements by February 28, there is still certain aspects, aspects of the 40 plus 9 which will impose on Guyana certain implementation requirements. And I think it's a position of the private sector that, look, pass the bill, because you, you listened in the clip earlier from Mr. Hernandez, the bill as is currently that he saw and CFAT saw complies with their requirement. So our position is pass that bill, and there's mechanisms in place to ensure the implementation of whatever were agreed in that, um, in that legislation. Because every six months when FATF meets, there's a review process which Guyana would have to subject itself to. Uh, so there's an appropriate mechanism in there. Uh, the risk we, we face as a country, and I won't spend long on this, is if we change or we amend the legislation uh, significantly from its current form, we run, we, we run the risk of, of turning the bill from being compliant to non-compliant when the review starts. And the review only starts when the legislation is passed. It goes to CFATF. They'll review and assess the, the, the legislation as is. And they can rule, primarily rule, it's now non-compliant because of all these changes you've made. And then they'll refer to CFATF or they, they'll report to CFATF that Guyana is a non-compliant country. And come in June, May, June, we could very well end up on an international blacklist as opposed to the current only CFATF Caribbean jurisdiction blacklist. Um, in, in essence, when you listen to what Mr. Hernandez has said, um, as is now, all that we're required to do is to go to Parliament tomorrow, Thursday, and pass the legislation. Because what he's saying in essence is that um, there is no need at this point in time to add or delete anything. Uh, let, let me come in there. First of all, what you saw on the clip pretty well represents what he said to us. Um, and there are two things about what he said to us that we need to emphasize. First of all, these deadlines are absolutely real and are being taken absolutely seriously by, by both uh, CFATF and, and uh, FATF. They are not exaggerated, uh, they're not fake, they're not set by us, it's set by them. Uh, and I thought that Hernandez's visit here emphasized that very clearly. Uh, secondly, Hernandez spelt out in no uncertain terms that the consequences of not reporting in that we have passed legislation that is compliant and meets the requirements set out by CFATF. If we don't do that, and we don't report that in by the 28th, then inevitably the process is going to take us to FATF, and unless uh, some remarkable changes have taken place before that, which seem at this point in time unlikely, uh, then FATF will ultimately uh, refer us to uh, what, is, what is called um, the IC. The International, RG, Cooperation, the International Cooperation Review, Review Group. Group. And then they will start issuing uh, countermeasures uh, internationally that Guyana will take two, if not three years, to recover from with the best will, will in the world. Uh, the most important thing that we heard in that clip is that the legislation that is currently before the select committee and has sat there now for seven months, backwards and forwards from there to Parliament, back to the select committee. That legislation is in fact in compliant with their requirements. And if that legislation were to come from the select committee to the National Assembly tomorrow and be passed, we would have met our obligations to begin with, we would not have met all of our obligations. 
but we will have met the first part of the obligations. What has complicated the issue? Well, what's complicated the issue is that in the case of one of the opposition parties, uh, they have brought to the select committee at the very last moment a whole host of amendments. Amendments which don't apply to the bill that's before the House, which which apply to the substantive or the principal act. The position of APNU is, and when we met with them, they told us that, their position is that they want those amendments now included in the bill. Well, the possibility exists that these amendments could, could um, well, maybe make an non Because it's an important point that kid has made. Let me come to that. Let me come to that. In amending that bill to include those um, amendments, even if the government were to agree to those amendments, and even if AFC were to agree to those amendments, and those amendments themselves are extremely controversial, and, and the private sector is not happy w with them. Uh, even if they were to be included, there is a very definite possibility, as, as Clinton has already pointed out, that they will make the, the bill non-compliant. And Hernandez made that very clear it's important because when, he, when he met with us. The, the issue of the Principal Act, that Principal Act, would have formed the foundation for CFAT when they issued that um, circular last May. That foundation represented to them an ideal um, base legislation. And it exist needed, already existing. Yeah, it's already existing. And <laughs> that, that was as you can take that as a first step or a first or a base position. Mm -hmm. And what CFAT ever said is not to fundamentally alter that principle act, but to strengthen it with amendments. So what we have here with these proposed amendments is to go back into that principal act, which is already accepted by the international body, and we're saying let's alter it significantly. But, but now, yeah. the argument that APNU offered to us when we met with them is that they're not satisfied with simply passing the legislation as is exists now uh, before the um, select committee and even though it meets the requirements that CFATF has, has set out, they want to be sure that the implementation of the legislation going forward is stronger and effective. We don't have a quarrel with that. We have a quarrel with when they're attempting to do it and how. There is nothing in the world to prevent uh, APNU for having brought their own bill to the House, amending the Principal Act. That could have been done before, and it can still be done now. Because they have a majority in the House in any case. That, that, uh, but the first that. hurdle, and this is where I think the public picture has been blurred, the first hurdle that has to be overcome. The first obligation that the country must meet is to satisfy the basic requirements set out by CFATF, and those are satisfiable simply by taking the current bill that is in the Select Committee and passing it. But don't you think we're causing ourselves, um, when I say ourselves, I mean Guyana, unnecessary trouble? Because based on what Mr. Hernandez would have said, is that the bill before the House, before the, uh, in the Special Select Committee, as is, is okay. It means nine months ago, mm. nine months ago, we could have passed this bill and avoid all of this that is happening now. Maybe we could have been looking at those amendments that you're talking about um, to was, the Principal Act. It certainly was a missed opportunity when the first two deadlines came about. Because if the APNU had proposed their amendments then, 
we would have had ample time to discuss, negotiate, consult with other bodies, because I'm certain had the APNU made those proposals earlier, even the Private Sector Commission, and I can speak uh, for my organization, the Chamber of Commerce, we would have definitely appeared before the committee to voice our objection or support to certain aspects of some of those, um, so those proposed amendments. One of the things you didn't hear from the clip um, by Hernandez is the fact that what happens, what are the consequences when we get on the, the blacklist or the countermeasures are applied and how long it takes to get up there. We're talking about a two-year period. If not more. Or more. Um, Guyana is stuck on that list and our companies, our private sector, doing business and transacting the international business becomes difficult or almost impossible. Well, you said previously in that discussion we had that already um, some businesses um, are affected because of the regional... Um, Let me tell you what Hernandez told us. Hernandez said that as a result of having missed those previous deadlines, CFATF has already reported us as requiring countermeasures within the Caribbean. The, Caribbean. the Bank of, Guy of Trinidad and Tobago, the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, has already recommended countermeasures against Guyana. Already. And that is beginning to take place throughout the yeah, Caribbean the community. The Caribbean banks deal with American banks. So anything that the Caribbean banks do, the American banks that service the Caribbean banks, including Guyana's bank, uh, is going to be uh, in, uh, involving the American banks. We have information already in the private sector that a couple of major uh, Car uh, New York banks have begun to take countermeasures. And those countermeasures are very severe and very restricting. In simple terms, so that the ordinary man who is listening to this program can grasp it, a simple financial transaction through a bank, sending money abroad, getting money home, buying something overseas, a spare part, something you need, something to conduct your business, now will undergo very severe restrictions, will undergo inspections that can take days, if not weeks. i give you an example from the aviation industry, which, as you know, I consult with. An aircraft maintenance requires frequent replacement of major components. Those components are shipped overseas, uh, they over undergo major overhaul, then they come back. In the meantime, you rent or get another component to replace them. That means an aircraft is down. It's not flying. In a fleet, in a major fleet, which has, say, five or six aircraft, you remove one aircraft, for any considerable length of time. And that is the inability of our aviation industry to service the mining industry in this country, to service the interior, to service interior communities, to service the forest industry. Uh, all that is going to impact across the board. Now, remittances. A whole host of Guyanese, very ordinary people, depend every day for leading a reasonably comfortable life from remittances from their families overseas. Those remittances are inevitably going to get caught up in this restriction and oversight that is now being imposed on financial transactions. So this is not just hitting the private sector. It's hitting everyone in this country. I agree. And, and there's, there's a worry in development. There's a, there's a view that the charges or the consequences are either exaggerated or they're being trumped up by the government or just a few actors within the private sector community. But we've seen over the past year, we've seen actors from the Bankers Association, the, industri uh, the insurance. insurance association groups, with manufacturing association, with aviation, there's numerous examples where we've, we've had civil society and business organizations coming out and saying and informing us of the, the consequences to their businesses 
as it relates to not meeting these requirements. I don't know where those erroneous perceptions are coming from because you can even look at international best practices over the years or international examples and you would have seen countries that were on that list. They were happy within the two year period when you had the countermeasures um, in place, they were happy to come off that blacklisting and, and become compliant. I, I want to talk to you though specifically about the meeting with the opposition. You would have met with um, we met with them all. The AFC and, and the APNU. Yeah. And we'll also talk about your meeting with the government. But let us talk about those meetings first, because I think um, the challenge lies basically there. You know, we say, we say the same thing in all of those meetings. We say to them, this is not a matter for political gamesmanship. This is not a matter for uh, partisan politics. This is a matter that we ask you to address in terms of what you perfectly well know are the country's obligations to meeting the requirements of the international financial community on the subject of money laundering. That is where we begin and that is where we end with our uh, discussions with these parties. Private sector cannot enter into uh, issues of political bargaining between, and we don't think they belong there, quite frankly, uh, between parties uh, in the parliament, in parliament. Questions have been raised in terms, by APNU in particular, in terms of bills, for instance, that the president has rejected. APNU may be absolutely right where that is concerned. Certainly, where the private sector is concerned, we want to see local government legislation. We want to see it passed. We just don't think it is a matter that should become uh, involved in this particular issue. But it has become involved. But we can't address that. What we can address and what we do address is the realities of not meeting these obligations to the economy of the country. And the economy of the country is going to be hit severely by these restrictions being placed on us. But what was the response? Um, you've outlined all of this to the opposition and to the government. What has been the response in terms of tomorrow, Thursday, when this bill, uh, or if this bill, comes up in Parliament because the Special Select Committee is meeting today. Um, we don't know the result of that, what will come out of there. Should this bill um, reach to Parliament, what was the response from the, the political parties in terms of ensuring that Guyana meets uh, the February 20th deadline? Edward, the only way an agreement could be met by tomorrow, by the deadline, is through dialogue and negotiations. Um, I was happy to hear just before coming to do this interview that the government, I think the president, would be meeting representatives of both the parliamentary opposition to discuss an approach um, to meet the deadline tomorrow. They have, and to, that they have to find common they ground. They have to find, and what Kit is saying, we don't insert ourselves into that process. We try to facilitate and, and convince based on our um, interest, and our interest basically is private sector, and what's good for the economy. No, but what was the, um, the indication you got from the, the, the parties when you met with them with regards to this I'll bill? Are they willing to get this thing through I the will house? be brutally frank. Both of the opposition political parties see this set of circumstances as an opportunity for them to extract from the government what they think the government should have been giving. So they see it as a bargaining chip. That's their right as political parties to bargain with the government. And it is indeed the government's right to bargain back. To bargain. But is it your right to put the but nation it is at not. risk? Well, that's the question. That is the issue here. In the private sector, we must focus our attention on what this does to doing business, what this does to the economy, what this does to our financial well-being 
as a country. That is where we focus our attention. All we can say, and we continue to repeat, and we've issued a press statement uh, this morning again on the matter, all we can say to the political parties, that is, the political party that is in government and the political parties that are in opposition, is please reach beyond, reach beyond, rise above your primary political concerns and look at the bigger picture because it is a bigger picture that, that is in place right now. It is a bigger picture. Guyana cannot escape its obligations to meet the international requirements with regard to money laundering legislation. We cannot escape it and we will suffer the consequences of attempting to escape it. The biggest risk, Edward, that we face with the, uh, what I would say, I would say untimely um, amendments being proposed, for instance, by the a a APNU. The risk we face, and we've said it, Hernandez has said it, once the assessment starts, and as Kit has said, government, all the opposition parties can agree to those amendments tomorrow. But if they agree to them, and it goes to the assessment body at CFATF, and they find that it, it's, it is now non-compliant, we still face countermeasures. And that's the significant risk. And I think that's why the private sector maintains a position. Let's pass the best legislation tomorrow that, satisfy, that we be sure satisfies the requirement of CFATF. Now, Hernandez did not say, and Apnu have made this point publicly, Hernandez did not say, that you cannot then proceed to strengthen that legislation, particularly with regard to its implementation. Correct. And he couldn't say that. That is the internal right and requirement of the country. What he did say, however, is what you've got there now in place that they have seen will meet the obligations at this point in time. It's a first necessary step. essential step. You don't take that step, you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, of Guyana's future as it relates to being sanctioned, um, mm -hmm. we, have, we have what is necessary in front of us. It's just a matter of um, political consensus and move that forward. But should we fail to, to, to meet this deadline? I know the implications internationally, um, regionally. Um, what is the way forward for Guyanese? What, what, what will Guyanese do in terms of, or what do you think? Um, what Guyanese act, will do is what, that we will hurt. Uh, no, uh, in terms of the actions that we could take as, as, a, as a nation to ensure our political leaders um, work in the best interest. Uh, well, you know, the only way that the average man, you and me, all the population have, of putting pressure on the political parties which represent us is with our vote. There is always the public opinion that can be brought to bear, not only at election times, but in between, on parties. If I were an activist of APNU, or AFC, or the PPP, I would be saying to my party, hey, this is nonsense. Why are you putting the country at risk? Fix the country first. That's what the man in the street has to sit to do. That's what each one of us in our individual capacity have to do. We don't do nearly enough of that in this country. If this were going on in the USA, guess what? Thousands of letters would have already ended up on the desks of congressmen saying, this is a lot of nonsense, this got to fix. But we don't do that. We need to improve that much more in the way we, we handle our politics. No, but there, there have been attempts to, um, by the average man to, to ensure that his voice is heard in the National Assembly. Um, the private sector, for example, had attempted a petition on the same matter. 
And it got nowhere. Yeah, but yeah, Edward, well, the private sector is an organization. It's an organ. But Edward, a kid which is represents correct. not and and uh, I'm looking at it in, in a broader I, context, I not just the private sector, from. not just the businesses, because you employ the average man. But the ultimate consequence and the ultimate remedy would come at the polls, because that's the only way we we choose our elected representatives. It has to be done at the polls. One of the things that would happen if the private sector suffers as a result, and that's where I don't see the link, because people don't say, people see the private sector as a bunch of um, self-interest, profit-making. Protecting uh, our own interests. Protecting our own interests when we sit here. But if we suffer, the entire economy goes with it. Employment goes with it. Salaries uh, go Economic with it. growth goes with it. The Salaries cost, goes cost of living goes with it. Cost of living, inflation it. goes with it. Critical, so we pay taxes, the, the majority of taxes that the government collects come from the private sector. The private sector pay tax. Our number one industry, the gold and diamond mining extractive industry, lots of, lots of the transactions involved in international commerce and trade uh, and foreign exchange, that would be enormously and severely affected. So if I were to leave a, a message to our listeners. Yes, because we have to wrap this up now. I so. would say to them, this is your problem. This is going to become your problem. And you need to be talking to your political representatives to fix it and fix it fast. But should a short space of time, I'll talk to the elected representatives themselves. And I, I'll tell them they need to fix it. And they need to come up maybe overnight uh, with an amicable position and with a bill that satisfies CFAT and the international financial body's requirements. Mr. Kit Nascimento, uh, Mr. Clinton Orling, I want to thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I think we have, um, what, we have been able to put uh, a few things into perspective um, as it relates to Guyana's deadline. Um, and to those of you who have been at home um, with us, we want to thank you very much for joining us today. So, gentlemen, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. Good interview.